All right, so I see a lot of familiar faces again, so thanks for coming. So either there's two reasons you could have shown up again, because I did such a crap job last time that you're going to give me another chance, or you're really impressed that you want to come back, so I'm going to hope it's the second one. So but either way you're here, so thanks for coming, guys. Like last time, we're just going to get stuck back into this, and we're going to start off, of course, with we all agree on we want to lose weight, we want to lose body fat. Yeah, we still agree on that, we don't want to lose our muscle mass. And what's one of the first things we do or get told to do to lose weight? Exercise. Exercise. We exercise to burn fat, that's what we're told, right? Well, let's take a closer look at that. Let me tell you about this VO2 max test that I had done in late 2013 in Florida, in the States. So this is me having a test. You got this mask on, you got all these uh, gadgets attached to your chest. You start very low effort, and then they take you to very high effort, or in this case, maximum effort and exhaustion. It's also called a stress test, if anybody heard about that. Yeah? They're trying to see exactly how your body can perform under stress and what's the maximum amount of performance it can put out. Now you see the mask here that I have on, that can measure exactly what I'm burning. Whether I'm burning sugar, I'm burning fat as fuel. And how it works is this chart, and I promise this will almost be the most technical chart of the night, okay? But just bear with me. So you can see if you start from the left where it says 0.7, if the reading coming through that mask into the computer says 0.7, it means I'm burning 100% fat, okay? So, as we move up, if it, if it shows 0.85, you see I've illustrated that there in red, it means I'm burning 50% fat, 50% sugar. And if I'm right at 1.0, I'm burning pretty much 100% sugar. What really happens is that as you go from low effort, you start with high fat burning and low sugar burning. Okay? And as your effort goes up, you go more and more towards high sugar burning and low fat burning. So, more effort because you're, you're needing to fuel more quickly and only sugar can burn at that higher rate, as you increase the effort, then can you see how the fat burning, the arrow goes down, and the blue arrow, the sugar burning goes up. So let's say you start over here at this. Yeah, your effort is now low. You're burning a lot of fat. As the effort moves across, you see that the blue, if you go in these columns, you see how this is 100% pretty much yellow, which represents fat. In the middle, it's half and half, roughly. So it's 50% yellow, 50% blue, fat, and sugar. And as you get over here, it's pretty much all sugar. That low effort actually is where you burn the most fat, and high effort is where you burn the least fat. Yeah? And this is actually what this test shows. Like, this VO2 max test is like the golden standard of measuring human performance. And this is pretty much the scale that anybody goes through. Now, the top athletes or normal people, top athletes might, if they're really adapted to burning fat, they might be able to burn fat at a higher rate than, say, a normal person. But everybody, if you go from low effort to high effort, you're going to go from a lot of fat burning to more sugar burning. See, the more effort equals more sugar burning and less fat burning. So when I got on that treadmill and they put this mask on where they can measure that with what I was burning sugar or fat and I was standing still, at what number do you burn 100% fat? Anybody? Just to see if you were listening. 0 0.7. 0.7. Okay, I was standing still and I was 0 0.65. Okay. I was way off over here somewhere. Now they've never seen that before. Somebody standing still and burning 100% fat. 
think that's impressive? You're allowed to say yes, no? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. At what effort level was a high burning fat though? Zero. Zero. The very minimum. I was standing still, wasn't I? Would you call standing still pretty low effort? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. We agree on that? Could you call it no effort? It doesn't get much less effort than not moving, does it? Mm -hmm. And I was burning 100% fat. That's what the machine said. So unless that machine was wrong, this is how it works, guys. And as I said, this is normal for any human body. This is what anybody, I challenge anybody to find me a VO2 max test with any athlete or normal person that doesn't go from high fat burning to low. From high fat burning to high sugar burning. Get what I'm saying? I've never ever heard of anybody who goes from high sugar burning to high fat burning with more effort. This is how the human body works. So I just got a real big question. Was I really that impressive? What do you think about it? If it's normal for any human body to have that highest fat burning rate when you're pretty much putting out no effort, and all I was doing was standing there. I was just normal, wasn't I? As I said again, this is the normal chart anybody goes through. And we all agree now that no effort equals 100% fat burning. Okay? So why in the hell do we exercise to lose weight? It's my question. <laughs> I think we do it because we're told that we eat too much and move too little and that's why we get fat. Would that be fair? That's why we do it, right? But the science says otherwise. The best test in the world. There is no way you can measure more accurately than put this mask on, like I did in that test. So if exercise forces you into the sugar burning zone and you're trying to burn fat, can you see how it's one of the most counterproductive things you can do? Any questions on this so far? Wondering why the hell have I exercised to lose weight? The more you increase the effort, the more sugar you're going to burn. And no fat. So would it be fair this statement, we could cross that out, that we don't get fat because we eat too much and move too little, we can cross out the move too little part. Maybe we should even change it to remove too much. But would it be fair to cross that out for now? Okay. We'll come back to exercise, I promise. It's a big subject, okay, and it's not totally unrelated. So we're left with this one, we eat too much. Okay, let's look at that one. Energy in is more than energy out. Well. That is true, because you can't build something out of nothing. That's true. Good point. But I want to propose to you that it's not so much energy in that's the problem, it's energy out. And, of course, we interpret that if there's not enough energy going out, it's because we move too little. But now we know that's not true. So, what is the problem? But the human is a lot more complex than just this simple math equation. And I want to try and show you that, how that really works. Let's say we have this room and it's a fat cell. Okay? We have one indoor and we have one outdoor, which means you can only come in this door and you can only go out this door that's over here, which is an imaginary door, right now. And then let's say, one dark and stormy night. I just wanted to say that, that's why I put that in. <laughs> it just gets really crowded. Okay? It just gets more and more crowded. People are finishing their meal, then they're standing up, more people coming in. And this room is just packed to the rafters, okay? If we're standing outside here, and you and I are looking at this room and we're going, why is it so crowded? And I'll say, well, listen, I know what's not the problem. 
and I know it's not people coming in. What is the problem? No people go out. There's no people going out. And why would that be? Why aren't they getting out? There's a door for coming in, there's a door for going out. They don't know which door. <laughs> they don't know which door? Okay. The door is closed. Look. The door is locked, okay, would it be fair to say? The outdoor is jammed, locked, closed, it doesn't work. So people are coming in, that door is open. But this one is not working. And they can't go out that one. So it's just coming in, filling up with people, and no one's going out. That's what's happening in your fat cells. Imagine this. So your fat cells are meant for temporary energy storage. Nobody can live with like 0% body fat. Nobody. We all need fat. It's essential to have some of that. It's just that it's meant to be a wallet. So just like you go to the ATM, you get some money out, this is the people coming into the room, put it in your wallet, and then you spend it. Just like the people would go out of the room. Understand? Just like your wallet is that temporary storage of your money until you spend it, that's how your fat cells are supposed to be. You're supposed to store the energy temporarily. Everybody clear on that? But when the outdoor is jammed or closed or bolted shut, it becomes a bolt. See the difference? Big difference, huh? So what makes a fat cell become a vault? Why would it close the outdoor? Hormones is what regulates when that door opens or shuts. Now we only already got the answer, but there's a big daddy of fat making. And that's insulin. You might have heard of insulin. What does insulin actually do? What does insulin regulate? Blood sugar. The blue gave it away a bit. I think that was pretty clever, that blue question mark and the sugar before. Okay, it regulates your blood sugar. And how does it do it? This will be the second most technical chart of the night, I promise. So as your blood sugar goes up, your insulin has to regulate that so it doesn't go too high. So insulin is released into your bloodstream and it takes some of that blood sugar and it goes in, into all your cells to be used as energy straight away. If there's still some left in your blood and your blood sugar is still too high, it's going to put it into storage. And it stores it a little bit in the muscles and then mainly the rest in your liver. And when your muscles and liver are full, the rest goes into your fat cells. Now you see a little arrow there from the liver to the fat cells? That's because sugar needs to be converted to fat in your liver before it's stored in the fat cells as fat. But you get the picture? Everybody get pretty clear on this? Right. So, if insulin is high in your blood, you can imagine the indoors open, but the outdoors closed in the fat cell. Just like we talked about the room before. Yeah? What foods make insulin go up? What foods stimulate your blood sugar? Carbohydrates, sugar. Carbohydrate, sugar. That's what makes insulin go up. So where do we find carbohydrates in this little puppet? We all know the food pyramid. Where are the carbohydrates mainly? At the bottom? They're mainly here, aren't they? At the bottom, in fruit, in vegetables, but mainly only in root vegetables. So vegetables in the ground, they have a higher sugar content. And obviously, sugar right at the top. Okay? Protein can make blood sugar go up. But I put that question mark on the arrow up because it's not so likely. But if you overeat a protein, it can get broken down and converted into sugar, and that could stimulate your insulin. 
So where do we find protein? In the little pyramid. Meat, fish. In the middle. In this In dairy and in meat. Dairy is not so high, it's medium in protein, but mainly in, in meat. Yeah? All kinds of meat. Eggs. Then finally we have fat. Dietary, the fat you eat, it has no effect on your insulin, on your blood sugar. Where do we find fat? A little bit at the top. That little bit of oil there. A little bit in, in, um, in dairy and also depending on how fatty meat you have, obviously you'll have fat there. Fat in vegetables or fruit. I think it is fruit. Avocado. Okay. Avocado. Yeah, you find a high fat in avocado. And if coconut is a, a vegetable or a, um, a fruit, then um, yeah, you find high fat in, in coconut oil as well. Mainly in, in coconut, it's mainly in the, the milk with the meat squeezed and also in the oil, which is another extract from the milk. So the coconut water uh, is quite high, quite high in sugar, so that will stimulate your blood sugar and insulin. I've tested it myself, so. But as you can see, we're getting towards where we need to eat some fat. Okay, so everybody got this, that when you keep your insulin low, that's when you have fat can escape from your fat cells, yeah? And when does your insulin go high? What stimulates your insulin mainly? Carbs and sugar, yeah? Carbohydrates, pretty much is sugar once it comes into your body. So really we can say, what we, how we get fat is determined by our sensitivity. But sensitivity to what? Insulin for high fat carbs. Correct. Insulin sensitivity. So, if you look at this here, if you are very sensitive to insulin, then you're likely to be slim. Because what that means is that when sugar hits your bloodstream and insulin comes in to get rid of that sugar and put it into your muscles, your muscles especially are very, very sensitive, they respond to the insulin and they take it, they can take in this sugar in huge amounts and burn it up as energy. So that means you're very insulin sensitive. See at the other end of the scale, we have very resistant. It means that exactly the opposite. Sugar hits a bloodstream, insulin is released, but your muscles especially don't respond very well. They can only take in so much. So most of that will then go to fat storage. Understand the difference? Okay, so this is like the two extreme ends of the scale. And every, of course, you have everywhere in between. So you could say IS equals CT. That makes sense? Okay, carbohydrate tolerance. Just to simplify things, okay? So instead of keep talking about insulin sensitivity, I'm just going to talk about carbohydrate. So if you're very tolerant to carbohydrates, you can use them up as energy. If you're not, you're more likely to be fat. So if you're at this end of the scale, very tolerant, so you're more likely to be slim, then you can sort of think of it as an energy gauge. Whenever you take in energy, or you eat, you make energy, okay? So the scale is sort of goes, goes to E because you're making energy from the food you eat, especially carbohydrates. And you might, might be very likely to look like this and be engaged in this sort of long distance running, marathon running, be very active, just naturally. Because the energy you take in, gets made into energy. And normally we look at somebody like this and say, well, of course they're skinny. 
They're skinny because they run so much. That's what we normally say, isn't it? But now that we know that fat is actually regulated, and your energy is regulated by your hormones, especially inside, would it be possible they run because they're skinny? Is that a possibility? Absolutely it's a possibility. Because every time they eat, they make energy. So they got to do something. And some of them run. But you know what, even if they didn't run, they'd probably be skinny anyway. It's just the way their body is designed. So on the other end of the scale, we have somebody who's very carbohydrate intolerant. And they're more likely to be fat. Because when they take in food, it doesn't go to energy, it goes to fat. Again, you imagine this fuel gauge, it's going to fat rather than the other side, which is energy. And we have somebody who might look like this. We've all seen them morbidly obese. Yeah? And what do we say? We say, of course they're fat. Like they're getting fat because they're so lazy. But maybe they're lazy because they're getting fat. See the difference? It's a world of difference, isn't it? Because when they eat, again, to reiterate this point, their fuel gauge is towards fat. And it's almost no matter how much they eat, it's just all going to go to fat production. Now last time somebody asked me, well, is this why they need to eat more and more and more? We see somebody there and they're just, they're eating a lot more calories than they actually need. Because you imagine this, if a person has, let's say the average person has about 2,500 uh, calories they need in a day, just to maintain body functions. Well here now you have somebody where, let's say, 40% is extreme, but let's say that just for, for this example, it's going to fat storage every time they eat. That means a thousand calories. So now they're just a thousand calories in deficit just to maintain bodily function. So now they need to eat three and a half. And if they don't break that cycle, this just escalates. Understand what's happening here? So these people, we look at them. We wouldn't actually think they're starving, would we? But they are. See how the body's malfunctioning? And what, what first woke me up to this is one of the researchers I'm going to tell you about later on. He said, I always imagined that they would have a lot of muscle under all this fat. Because in theory, they carry around a lot of weight. Now, what was really interesting about what he talked about was that they had a group and they had these chronic back pains and they couldn't work out what it was, so they did CT scans on it. And it turned out that some of their muscles in the back was like paper thin. The body was eating itself up from the inside. So they were starving. But, especially with obese people, what do we say? It becomes a moral issue and a character issue. You're just not strong enough to eat less. You just eat too much and you move too little. That's what they're told. Over again and again and again. But we know neither of those are true. Are you with me so far? Yeah. And guys, this is not something I've come up with. This is actually basic anatomy. Okay? And I'm going to also share with you where I've learned all this. This is freely available. You can look up the insulin response, for example, in any anatomy book. This is how fat is accumulated in the human body. But could we say that eat too much is still true to a point? So whatever's a big question mark like that, you're, you know, you can come up with the answer. If you eat too much carbohydrate, the insulin is going to go up, yeah? So, 
we could say it's a little bit true. Eat too much, but in very specific context. Okay? So what determines your tolerance? Like what determines whether you're at one end of the scale or the other end of the scale? Like what's the number one thing? Someone like me would be somewhere in the middle, probably towards the very tolerant, yeah? But what determines that I landed on that scale right then? Okay, the number one thing is your genes. And you don't really have much control, do you? Would you say that? Like, no control? You know, if you're not happy with it, you're going to have to take it up with your parents, you know? But it's not going to change much. Not to say that people are cattle, but to illustrate a point. This is two different cattle breeds. The top one is a jersey, and the bottom one is a limousine. What distinguishes these two breeds, anybody know? What they eat? Well, they both pretty much eat the same. They fit exactly the same diet. I mean, grass and then in some instances, grains. They have exactly the same diet, so why are they turning out different? They're genes. Okay? Now, this bull at the bottom, that's a bull that my parents bred. They're, they're cattle breeders. I said it's called Dinnison. It's one of the best breeds for making meat. Now, in this picture, that guy there is about 1.3 ton. Okay? And it's pretty much all muscle. You can feed him and feed him and feed him and feed him and he'll just put on more muscle, 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 muscle and hardly any fat. And that particular breed is known for that. Okay? The, 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 the nickname for it, so to speak, is the carcass breed. Right? They just make meat. But you can feed the top bull exactly the same diet and he'll still look like that. He'll never ever look like the bottom guy. And that's because one's a milk producer and one's a meat producer. So if you're producing milk, this is a female version, just to be fair. <laughs> Imagine if you're a dairy farmer, you're producing milk, and you're putting energy into your cattle, you don't want it to go into meat. You want it to go to milk, because that's what you're producing. Now, the limousine breeder, they don't want all their energy going to, to milk. They want it going to what? Meat. So two farmers take two different breeds because they want two different results. And yet, in animals, we don't doubt that genes is the most important thing. But it seems that when it comes to humans, oh no, it's all just moral and character issues. Our body shapes. Well, would you say this guy just ate too much and the other guys ate too little? Or would you say that genes would have an, quite an impact on that, how they turned out? Yeah. Yeah? They could even have the same diet. But genes is such a huge impact that not just our body structure, but also, as I'll show you tonight, the regulation of how much, how our fat tissue is regulated. Anybody know this guy? It's a bit of a bad picture. That's Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal, one of the most famous basketball players. He didn't sort of get that size because he played basketball, did he? And the other guy was small because he never played basketball. <laughs> All different diet. It was something to do with genes, right? So genes is a huge impact in how you are today. So number one is your genes. In fact, tissue regulation. And you have no control. But I want you to think about that as your starting point on the scale. We can't change that. But it is just where you start. Okay, so what I want you to do is not get discouraged, but if you could, I believe really understanding is the most powerful weapon we have for making change in our lives. And that's what I'm trying to give you here tonight. And I think understanding what we can't change is just as important as understanding what we can change. So what's number two? It's basically two points in fat regulation. 
Now mind your genes, we can't control that. What's number two? Diet. The food you eat. Okay? And that, my friends, we can control. So now I'm presenting you with a problem. We're going to take a little break, five, ten minutes, and I'm going to give you the solution.